question about different types of surgical interventions. Um, one is called vagus nerve stimulation, or VNS. And in fact, in the US, they um, have actually tighter regulatory rules about approving medical devices. And the vagus nerve stimulation device was, in fact, approved last year. The, the point is we have a vagus nerve going up and into our brain that connects to some of the areas that release serotonin and norepinephrine and many of the transmitters that are involved in our emotional uh, states. And the concept is that the vagus nerve being what I call tickled by a device uh, in a similar way um, would somehow treat depression. Now, the advantage to vagus nerve stimulation is that you don't go into the brain, you go into the neck. The disadvantage is that even in the studies that were carried out, um, the success rate was of the region of 15 to 20 percent. And in some of the studies, it didn't really uh, kick in until the second year. So I would think that there will be some people who will be helped by vagus nerve stimulation, but it hasn't, in, and I actually took part in some of the earlier studies with it, it hasn't appeared to be um, as markedly effective. But nevertheless, I, I, I think it will help. And by the way, it also comes from the background of work on epilepsy where it was first established. Yes? So that's an excellent qu the, qu the question is, why don't we make better use of uh, technologies like uh, PET? And um, now just to spell out the difference between fMRI and structural MRI, if, if you have a brain tumor or you've had a stroke and you get a structural MRI, it'll show this area. What F stands for functional. If you have an fMRI, for example, um, we are doing studies at the moment where we show people different pictures. We show them pictures that might uh, frighten them, that might disgust them, might make them sad, might make them anxious, or are totally neutral. And we can actually see how the different brain areas respond to these pictures. Now, the problem with both PET and fMRI um, is that we can take a group of people with, for example, depression, and we can show that there's a difference in the group compared to people who don't have depression. Or we can even take the depressed group before they got a treatment and compare them to themselves afterwards. But these technologies, with a few exceptions, have not yet got to the point of being diagnostic for an individual person. And so I, I think you're right to ask the question, and I think that it's only by sort of building a larger sort of banks of, of data that we'll begin to really uh, make the, the profile fit the treatment. Uh, when I talk about major depressive disorder, it's as if this is one uh, single disorder. In truth, it's probably lots of different disorders. And MRI and other technologies will probably help us to tease apart the different types of, of disease. Um, yes? Well, these are great questions. I, I think what we see from some of these imaging studies is that there are actually, um, let me, let me uh, this is overly simplistic, and I apologize to any of the uh, neurology colleagues or others, but uh, one could say that in depression, the frontal areas tend to be a bit dumbed down or slowed down. So there's not as much what we might call executive function, planning, thinking ahead, having motivation, drive, and energy. And some of the limbic regions may be overly fired, like that uh, cingulate part where there's too much action. And you might 
speculate that this singular area 25 is like a switching station. And if it can't make the switch, then the limbic regions are overstimulated and the other areas are underactive. So what we're trying to do essentially is open the, uh, the stuck switch, if you like. Um, but the, 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 I think we've learned a lot to say you don't just look at one region in isolation. You have to look at how um, different areas talk to each other and even compensate for each other um, if one area is not working properly. Well, uh, here. We think we know uh, some things, but I think that if, if I had to give a one-word answer, it would be we don't truly understand. We know, for example, that that hippocampal area um, is very active and can even form new cells and new growth. We used to think all the brain cells just died as we kind of aged. But we know that certain areas um, can actually produce new cells. We know that in depression, those things go down. And one of the things that virtually every antidepressant has in common, including shock treatment, lithium uh, medications, is that they switch this, what we call neurogenesis, back on again in the hippocampus. We think deep brain stimulation does the same. Dr. Lozano and colleagues are working in animal studies to try and understand how this uh, actually happens. Yes? The question is, why do women suffer from depression uh, with a frequency that's twice that of men? Yes? Yeah. There are many answers to that, and many of my colleagues could, could do a better job. Um, some people take a kind of uh, socio-cultural perspective on the role of women. Um, others focus on some of the reproductive hormone changes. Um, and it's certainly true that if you carry... Um, some of the, what you might call, genetic risks for depression. You're more prone as a woman uh, at childbirth, at different uh, reproductive times, and at menopause to have depression and even to not respond to treatments that you previously did respond to. So I think the truth is that there are probably multiple reasons. Uh, a third issue is that many people feel men have often deflected depression towards substance abuse um, and so that it, it may be a, almost a, a closet variant of, of depression in men. But nevertheless, there is a consistent finding uh, almost throughout the world that the, the, the balance is two to one towards women. Yeah. 